green and pleasant land. Streams choked with sewage. Our vital heathland lost to development. And our coastline littered with dead birds. Welcome to 21st century Britain. Our NHS, our schools crumbling, our household budgets in crisis. And tonight, a new landmark report from our major environmental charities shows that across Britain, nature itself is nearing a state of collapse. The state of nature's headline figure, a 19% decline in species numbers. That's a fifth gone since the 70s. In human terms, like losing the populations of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Manchester. We're already one of the world's most nature depleted countries. One in six of our species now threatened with extinction. Just 10 years ago, it was one in 10. That includes nearly half of our birds, a third of our amphibians and reptiles, and over a quarter of our mammals. Half of our plants have vanished from where they used to grow, and insect pollinators vital for our food, a fifth have gone. This is the fourth State of Nature report in 10 years and the really worrying news is that there's absolutely no sign of any let up in the declines we're seeing in nature and the speed with which that's happening. And I think what we've seen over the last decade is no shortage of big ambitious promises from the government. We've seen pretty appalling delivery and what we see now is the result of this. Our report really highlights the disastrous state nature is facing in our country. It is based on some of the best science in the world. It shows that conservation works and can be effective, but we are not winning the battle. We need to see change at scale, and that's where our government has to step in to enable that change to happen. We've traveled across the country to see how broken Britain's environment really is. First, chalk streams. We have 85% of the world's total, a priority habitat but only 14% of even priority habitats are in good health. There should be lots of brown trout in the river. There should be ranunculus waterweed. And where are the insects? It's silent. And we look beneath the surface, we can see why. Look at this. It's a thick mat of filamentous algae. And this has come because of nutrient pollution from water companies and from agriculture. Last month, they dumped raw sewage upstream here for over 70 hours. The State of Nature report says a quarter of our freshwater fish are threatened. What we need is for our government to regulate industry properly, otherwise we're going to see ecologically dead chalk streams across the whole of England. Britain is becoming the dirty man of Europe once again, but it's not just sewage, it's also huge amounts of pollution from agriculture. Today's report again cites intensive farming as driving nature loss continuing to pour poisons, some banned internationally, across our land. It's deadly silent. The insects aren't here and the birds aren't here. Farmers can do it right, but they need the right kind of support from government. And they've been so slow in bringing in the right kind of support for farmers so the land is protected for insects. Every element of our economy can be traced back to a dependence on nature. Reversing the trend in biodiversity loss is going to be the defining economic challenge of our generation. Development threatening our critical lowland heaths. Here in Somerset, our only venomous snake should thrive. It's taken us an hour and a half to find this, and we're in an adder stronghold. They're not abundant, even here. Habitat loss is the greatest issue, not just the loss of it, but the fragmentation of it as well. The decline is so sharp and so widespread across the country that I don't think our children are going to be around to see these creatures for much longer. I think it really is a tragedy. A tragedy too on our beaches. Arctic terns fly 9,000 miles to breed here on the Northumbrian coast. Half their chicks this summer succumbed to bird flu, a disease traced back to factory farming in China. It's just so heartbreaking, really. You feel relatively powerless as well to do anything about it when you're seeing birds dying, when you're seeing sick birds, really lethargic, showing symptoms. But it's not just avian flu. This year, we've had the highest sea temperatures in the North Sea uh, on record, 
and there's real worry about how that's going to impact on the main food source of the Arctic terns. Sand eels potentially going to be driven further north into colder water, which might put them out of reach. It's not just our seabirds that are in trouble. Around half of our birds are now in decline. And it's the exacerbation of things like climate change, factors that disrupt their food supply, uh, where they're going to nest. All of these factors accumulate, and you have to ask yourself how much more our birds can take. The Cairngorms, caught by the climate crisis. Time are going to need the cold, but the world is warming. They're now red-listed threatened with extinction. Back in 1990, we reckoned we had about 10,000 pairs of ptarmigan. Now we've got 2,000. We've talked about the climate emergency. It's now a nature climate crisis. If we don't do something about it, we will lose these birds. I mean, they've got nowhere to go. As long as we're still spraying vast amounts of pesticide in our wider countryside, species will decline. As long as we're still putting sewage and other pollution in our rivers, we will still see a decline in the health of our rivers. We know what we can do to turn this around, but sadly we're not seeing that leadership from government that's needed to make sure that happens. Ten years ago we knew we were in trouble. We've now had a decade of State of Nature reports. We know with a little help, nature can bounce back spectacularly. Many of our birds of prey are now increasing. Our seals are thriving. Species like storks breeding once again. But time is short. Our room for manoeuvre is narrowing. We've had biodiversity targets. They've been missed every single time. And that is where governments have been exposed as serial failures. The only thing that's really changed is that we have less time to address the problem. Alex Thompson with that report. Well, earlier I met Therese Coffey, the Environment Secretary, to discuss these findings and ask what the government is doing to tackle the biodiversity crisis. I joined her on a visit to a chalk stream in Hampshire and started by asking her whether giving the go-ahead for the Rosebank oil field was, as critics say, an act of environmental vandalism. We're still on a journey of transition and it's important uh, that we still have sources of oil as we make our way towards net zero. And I do remind your viewers that of course, we're still on track to reduce our 68% of emissions by the end of this decade, uh, and we are gradually reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. But we have added some extra uh, controls. So, for example, there won't be the normal flaring and venting that you might see with oil extraction. Um, but it's absolutely critical alongside, of course, the natural gas. Uh, but this all is part of our energy security uh, uh, plan as well. The annual emissions from Rosebank will be equivalent to the emissions from 28 countries or 56 coal-fired power stations running for a year. That doesn't sound like a transition. That sounds like all systems go on fossil fuel. Well, what we are seeing is a reduction of about 7% annually of, um, in, in the UK of use of that aspect of extracting of fossil fuels. Uh, that's considerably higher than what is happening globally. I think that we can show and have shown that we are making the necessary changes, but also for a just transition to people in this country as well, is that we have that uh, glide path and Rosebank is an important part of that. And you've just given the company behind Rosebank a massive tax break. Where is the justice in that? You talk about a just transition. Well, it's important that we uh, continue to uh, attract investment as part of getting towards net zero. Uh, and that will be done in a variety of ways. Uh, one of those is about supporting some of these energy companies in that regard. But we should remember that also they are paying a massive windfall levy too. Uh, but that takes aside some of the investment they're putting into energy as part of the transition to net zero. But today's State of Nature report shows that priority habitats like chalk streams like this one, only 14% of those are in a good state. Are we in a national emergency in terms of habitat? Well, I think the report um, highlights uh, the reason why we have had to get on with expanding the amount of work that we're doing to support nature and to restore nature. We've put into legislation uh, specific protection for chalk streams because we recognise these are a rare habitat. But that's why, as part of our environmental improvement plan, right across the country, we know there's lots more to do, but we're setting in place all the targets. We've set in place activity to develop it. And of course, we need to scale up, and that's what I'm determined to do. Why is it that a decade ago, when it was the first State of Nature report, one in 10 species were threatened with extinction. It's now one in six. And this has happened on your party's watch. I mean, what is the point of being conservative if you're not properly conserving 
our green and pleasant land? Well, I think some of the different projects that we've undertaken um, do take some time. So, uh, for but example... We've had 13 take... years. A lot of people are saying, well, how much longer do you need? We haven't well, got that much longer. Well, so, uh, indeed. And that's why, uh, since the last report, we have put in place uh, the legislation, which galvanises activity towards this. So we're bringing in biodiversity net gain improvement for all development that's happening uh, from uh, from January that will be uh, implemented from then. A lot of the criticism of your government is that there's just not a sense of urgency and then today we learn that you're delaying new environmental laws, biodiversity net gain rules which would have forced housing developers to improve the countryside and wildlife habitat so when are you going to introduce these laws? The legislation will be laid in November and it will come we will start implementing from the beginning of January. Right, so that's a small delay. Small delay, six-week delay. OK, but when you come to the neutrality rules, which you tried to axe, the Lords voted it down, uh, river pollution safeguards being weakened um, under your government, are you still determined to axe those rules? Well, the overall outcomes for what was going to happen um, with the package going alongside the change in legislation would have actually improved significantly. Uh, well, you say that, but the Office for Environmental Protection is clear that the proposed changes were, and I quote, a regression in environmental law. That would not have been the outcome. So what we were seeing is uncertainty, a delay in house building, important to people trying to either get their first rung on the ladder. At the same time, because of the uncertainty, those homes not being built, a very small amount of uh, extra pollution, you know, frankly, coming from our daily activities, would have gone into rivers. Immediately, extra money was being provided to start all the different projects uh, that at the moment uh, were going to go beyond what developers might have done. So would you like to see the bill reintroduced? I think that we, it's important that we do try and reintroduce the legislation to unlock, get rid of that certainty and to unlock investment. So The I, truth is you've caved into your friends, the house builders and the developers, who are big Conservative donors. Isn't that the brutal political truth? Um, Cathy, what we have done is we're trying to help people get a home. In terms of what we need to do to improve nature, climate change is one of them, but it's also about pollution, it's also about invasive species, and it's also about increasing habitat. So we're on track to do that, and we've, but we have to, I accept, pick up the pace. Therese Coffey, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, with me here now is Labour MP Peter Kyle, who was recently appointed as Shadow Science, Innovation and Technology Secretary. Peter Kyle, we'll come on to the state of nature in a mm. moment, but let's start with that Rosebank decision. Mm. It's been called environmental vandalism by the Greens. Do you agree? And if so, why won't you reverse it? Well, if we're going to tackle some of the big issues that we face with climate change and get to net zero, we're going to have to have a partnership with these companies that are investing in renewables. We cannot attract global companies to invest in our country if they do not believe the word of the British state. So with Keir Starmer as Prime Minister, they were to trust that any contract entered into by the British state will be honoured. We've had a period where we had a, a Tory Prime Minister breaking domestic law, breaking international law, breaking our treaties and withdrawing from treaties. We've got to get back to the point, the place, where Britain is trusted again. That's Which why is we're taking. Politique, that's why we are. Though it's not real politics. This is about doing the national interests. We cannot get to net zero if we're not in having a partnership between government, the prime minister, the secretaries of state, plus all of those private sector investors and, and investors from other sectors as well. You can only do that if they trust us. Right. So if we keep breaking our word, the Tories can break their word. Keir Starmer, the Labour Party will not. But we're on the run-up to an election now, so I wonder if you can just help people work out, because you're sticking with Rosebank, you're sticking with the Tories' delay to phasing out gas boilers, uh, you've delayed your £28 billion a year green investment plan, but you will reinstate the ban on petrol and diesel cars by 2030. So is that the one big environmental policy where there's a key difference between you and the Tories? We will get to clean electricity production by 2030. We will double the number of onshore wind farms uh, and offshore uh, wind turbines as well. Uh, th this was extraordinary for us this week because we saw Rishi Sunak uh, parrot the European Union to follow the European Union's lead to get to for, for the for the ending of combustion vehicles. What we want to do is actually to use the difference between the EU and us to create a competitive advantage for British business, whilst also making sure we have the, the security and certainty for British business, for British motor manufacturers, so that they can carry on doing what they want to right. do, because they, they support this target. Okay. We can have a competitive advantage, we can get further towards our net zero targets. It is a win-win. I have well, no let... idea why Rishi Sunak decided okay. to follow the EU rather than actually use this competitive advantage well, that we have. Well, let's look at some of the nuts and bolts of what Labour policy would be, because we've been talking about the state of nature. Um, 
what, what is Labour's plan? for nature. What are you going to do to address this problem? Well, the first thing is you know that, that this is going to be a mission-led government led by Keir Starmer. One of those five missions that he's already announced uh, has at its heart uh, stopping the decline in nature and then reversing the, uh, the decline in nature. But how? Give me one so, policy. Well, one policy will be that we will expand wetlands and we will expand woodlands. We've done it in Wales already where we have a Labour government that can imp start implementing this stuff already. We will do those things uh, elsewhere as well. OK, we Wales. Find... You mentioned Wales, right? Let yeah. me ask you on the details of water here because mm. there are actually more spills, more sewage spills on average in Wales than there are in England and you're in power there, as you say. Now, you have a policy to reduce raw sewage discharges by 90% by 2030. That is only seven years away. How are you going to do that? Uh, we'll, again, we will have a strong legislative framework. We will have legally binding targets so that water companies have to reduce their water discharges uh, year upon year. You think uh, they'll these do it things, for you where they haven't for the Tories? They haven't pa so we've been pass passing these, uh, tabling these amendments now for five years. Every single time the Tories vote it down. We're wasting time. That's why when we get in, we're going to have to do this in an expedited way because the Tories have wasted so much time. They have voted against these measures time and again. We've been tabling them. So there's no right. question about where the Labour Party stands on this. Peter Carl, thanks very much for joining us. Well, I'm also here with Chris Packham, who's a presenter and a host of Nature and Wildlife pro programmes and a conservation and climate campaigner, and Lord Goldsmith, Zach Goldsmith, the Conservative peer and environmentalist. He resigned his ministerial post in June, accusing the government of apathy towards green issues, saying the Prime Minister was simply uninterested in them. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Chris Packham. And back to the State of Nature report, because when you read that 43% of birds in the UK are at risk of being lost forever, that more than half flowering plant species gone forever. How do you respond to what sounds like a nightmare scenario? It is a nightmare scenario. It feels like I and all the other conservationists are on a forced march to a funeral to all of the things that we love. We've invested in, we have the capacity to restore and recover nature, but we've been incapacitated by our ability to do it broadly enough and rapidly enough. So yes, we can fix things. The report identifies that, where we focus our endeavours on large proportions of an endangered population with good funding and our expertise, we can instigate that recovery. So give me an example of a practical measure that could address these problems. In the what about our reintroductions? Um, there can't be a handful of people in the UK that haven't seen a red kite today. So in the late 1980s, these birds were confined to a tiny area in Wales. We developed the expertise to put them back into our landscape where they play a valid ecological role. We can do that, and that's a very celebrated and obvious case. But behind the scenes, we're restoring habitats, uh, all sorts of things. Our problem is that only 11% of our land surface is protected areas, and only 50% of that is in good condition. And what the report clearly highlights is that the 71% of the land which is under farming is that which is suffering mm. most. We need to change our farming policies to make a difference. Right, well, that's very clear. Lord Goldsmith, your party's in power. You're supposed to... The Conservatives are supposed to conserve things. What has happened? Well, I mean, look, this, this report is, um, I mean, is devastating. Um, I don't think it's that surprising. Um, I don't think Chris was probably that surprised seeing the, the headlines from the report. But it's devastating. And it has... Much of the damage has happened on our watch. And there's no, there's no escaping that. And whereas I was pleased to hear some of the things that we just heard from Therese Coffey about some of the targets and legislation, the problem is that, yes, we brought in a lot of useful legislation, but we're yet to use much of that legislation, and we keep hearing about delays. So we heard today from a, a, a leak, I'm not sure where it came from, that the biodiversity net gain is being delayed. We had maybe six weeks, but it could be much longer than that. That was one of the flagship nature recovery uh, policies that we brought in three, four years ago as part right. of the Environment Bill. And there are many other examples, not just in relation to energy, carbon and so on, we, the, the car policy that we've already heard about, the, the new licenses for, for drilling. In relation to nature as well, we have seen a rowback. And I am yet to see a single survey or poll anywhere in this country asking any constituency whether or not they want more nature, where well, a majority don't come back saying, yes, we want okay. more nature, more biodiversity. So, so do you have any confidence, if Labour gets in, do you have any confidence they'll do any better? I don't at this point in time, and that's why tomorrow, with all of the NGOs, we're assembling outside of DEFRA. They will come with their own ask, but here will be mine. I want all of our principal parties to put robust, meaningful and realistic policies in their manifestos, giving us, who, uh, those of us who care about nature, something to vote for. And they will need to be focused very much on farming, fishing and forestry, 
for those practices to become far more nature friendly and critically for it to be mandatory. Now look, where we have higher level environmental schemes, we see significant changes. We see enhancement of biodiversity. Only 20% of our farmers are in those schemes. Mm. And why? Well, because funding has been cut back. In the last five years, it's been cut back by 5%. Over recent decades, it's been cut more significantly. Yeah. Our farmers are out there, well placed to do the work. They can't access the funding and they don't have the flexibility in those schemes to implement that on their land. We're on to money. It always comes back to money. The yeah. Business and Trade Secretary said recently, talking about this just transition to net zero that we've, yeah. we've heard from Therese Coffey earlier, a fair transition. Yeah. Business and Trade Secretary, bit of a cheap shot, said you have way more money than pretty much everyone in the UK. I put it to you, you can afford net zero, others can't. I, I think that completely misses the point. First of all, there's no, what we're talking about in relation to nature, yes, it requires resources, but vastly more resources today are being spent engaging in destructive practices. Our, our land use subsidies still to this day, despite the opportunities afforded to us by Brexit, continue to reward landowners for desecrating ecosystems. You're paid for the amount of farmable land you have. It doesn't matter what you do with it. So if you have a wonderful ecosystem that's not particularly productive, you convert it into you know, poor quality farmland, you get paid. All the incentives are wrong. So even just switching the way bad money is invested and putting it towards renewal and regeneration, that's going to fill much of the gap that we face. So I, I think this, that completely misses the point. In relation to net zero, uh, the, net zero is, the, 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 the problem here is not the specific issues that we keep hearing about from the government, where row back on this, row back on that. The problem here is the narrative, the story. What is happening is that the Conservative government is trying to copy America or Canada in the older, older days, Australia before the last election, and make climate and environment a political wedge issue. Well, and, and also that is Donald Trump has praised Rishi Sunak's well, environment go. policies. I mean, does he get your vote anymore? The, the, would you vote Labour or Green? I, I, I would never vote for, I, I don't know who I'll vote for, actually I'm not technically, but I would never vote for a political party that does not have uh, as close as possible to a comprehensive answer to the, what I think is an epoch what, defining. Though? You well, finish that sentence. I was about to give a very pompous answer. You can't vote if you're in the House of Lords, but I realise that's probably not a, not very. Uh, okay, but um, do you, Harry do you still support the Conservatives, uh, or have they lost look, your I, vote over I, this I issue? I joined the Conservative Party when they had almost no green policies. I set right. myself the goal of trying to weave a green thread. So I will yeah, continue. You have, you've, you've failed uh, in that well, goal. I succeeded in some areas and failed in right. many, many areas, of course. But that, but then all that tells me is I and, and anyone else who wants the Conservative Party to be in good shape have to keep fighting. Can I just say, Zach has been trying in that role and that needs to be recognised. We as conservationists have been trying throughout the course of this but what the report reveals is that collectively we failed mm. but we are failing in hand with all of the solutions that we have to succeed. We just must roll them out more broadly and more rapidly. And you say, uh, truthfully, you failed. You, you're, you've made this documentary for Channel 4 where you, you express your frustration that everything you've tried hasn't worked, voting, peaceful protest. And so you ask the question, you know, should you break the law to get the attention of the politicians? You haven't yet. Will you, do you think? Well, the laws are being constantly changed to repress our right for free speech and, and protest. It's becoming increasingly difficult to wear a T-shirt on the streets, let alone stand with a placard outside of a courtroom with wording on it which is written inside the courtroom, enshrining our, you know, democratic... So do you think you will have to break the law? Well, I think at some point in the future, if the laws change, we'll all be breaking the law. And that will only be following the footsteps of our government, which we've already heard, and Zach will attest, have been breaking the laws when it comes to managing our environment. But if you feel you're marching to a funeral, when you look at the suffragette, broke the law, you know, people might be a bit surprised that you're holding back here. Well, look, what we do in our programme is explore what will happen next and what the politicians tell us, that if protest isn't listened to when it's peaceful and democratic, then it mm. escalates. And so do there's a dangerous sympathize? precedent being set here by not listening to these climate protesters and further enraging them by doing lunatic things like sanctioning the drilling in Rosebank. Bit of wildlife there. Do you, do you sympathise? There are two things that politicians worry about. They worry about vested interest and, and the area that we're talking about at the moment is more rife with vested interest mm -hmm. and an honest politician's job is to resist that pressure and make good decisions. The other issue is votes. Now, I don't believe there is a majority anywhere in any party, except for maybe some of the marginal parties, for abandoning this agenda. Agenda. I right. really hope that's right and I hope that voters flex their muscles and there are many ways in which voters can do that but they have to let the government and the Labour yeah. Party know that they're not going to be rewarded if they abandon what is the greatest challenge we've ever faced and that, that is the key. Lord Goldsmith, Chris Packham, thank you both very thank much you. for joining us.